Family School Partnerships and develop this webinar series. So it's my honor to introduce an incredible individual who has really been an ardent advocate for family engagement and setting students up for success, Kwesi Rollins. So Kwesi is a member of IELS' senior leadership team and guides IELS' portfolio of programs designed to develop and support leaders with a particular emphasis on family and community engagement, early childhood education, and community-based leadership development. Kwesi? Uh, thanks so much, Daniel, and, and to our other partner in crime, uh, Helen uh, Westmoreland, who we don't now see on the screen, who's also part of the National PTA Center for Family Engagement. Uh, great pleasure to be a co-host in this series. Uh, today's topic is near and dear to IEL's heart. That we've been the home for the Coalition for Community Schools since its inception uh, in the late 90s, 97, 98. And uh, as we know, uh, community schools by design and community schools initiatives highly value family and community engagement, uh, but we work every day to try to make those partnerships more real, to make that engagement more meaningful. Uh, and one of the ways that is happening, and you'll, I'm very excited that you'll hear from folks today, is uh, the topic of today's webinar, Exploring PTA Community School Partnerships. So, Looking forward to hearing some of those details. Uh, looking forward to um, sharing with all of you the ways in which we can expand on that work and expand on our learning. And as you can see from the slide, we have a conference where four or 5,000 or so of our closest friends will be joining us in Atlanta. And that'll give you yet another opportunity to explore this and many, many additional issues at the National Community Schools and Family Engagement Conference at the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta. Sign up today. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Kwesi. So let me go ahead now and introduce um, Helen Westmoreland. So Helen is the Director of Family Engagement at National PTA, who leads the association and managing our Center for Family Engagement to provide us with some framing for this webinar. Helen? Thank you, Daniel, um, and thank you, Kwesi. I want to just um, echo the sentiment um, uh, here at National PTA. We are just so pleased to be able to partner with the Institute for Educational Leadership on this webinar series and all things family and community engagement. Um, we're very lucky to have such wonderful partners um, in this space. Um, so for those of you who may be new to PTA, um, our mission is to engage and empower families and communities to advocate for all children. Um, we are an organization of nearly 3 million members working together to make um, every child's potential a reality. We're excited for today's conversation and our transforming family school partnerships with the PTA national uh, standards. Um, and I would just like to start not only by thanking IEL, but our panelists who are going to join us in just a moment. We're all here today because we know families are essential partners to providing a high quality education for every student. And based on decades of research, we know that students whose families are engaged are more successful. We know teachers and schools are better off and better places of belonging when we invest in our families. So the question isn't really, should we do this, but how do we do this? And we hope this webinar series will shine a little bit of a light on that. Uh, if you're new, you can check out last year's webinar series we did as well, which focused on some more specific topics, um, in addition to this year where we are focusing on some systemic issues. Um, as a little context for sort of some of the foundation for how we came together, uh, over 20 years ago, National PTA created the National Standards for Family School Partnerships. These PTA National Standards really set the bar for how we should all work together to support student success. Since their initial creation, the PTA National Standards have been used by PTA schools, districts, state education agencies, at one point even the U.S. Department of Education, for accountability, but also for support and really building capacity for stronger family engagement. Last year, we updated these national standards to reflect current research and best practice, as well as the perspective of over 600 families, caregivers, youth, educators. You can see a lot of the partners we had the pleasure of working with um, in last year's series, as well as some of this year's series as well. 
Um, this year's continuation of our series, as I mentioned, is really diving into really some specific system level topics um, that we can address uh, together. So today's session will highlight the important connection between PTAs and community schools through a conversation with school and community leaders in New Mexico. New Mexico has been an exemplary state when it comes to implementing high quality community schools. Um, and as Quasi would probably tell us, community schools are not just in name. They are, there is a model, there are rigorous sort of essential pillars to this work, one of which is family engagement and, and will be some of our focus today. So we've invited four incredible individuals to discuss what these sort of strong PTA and community school partnerships can look like um, in your community and in their own community. So as we dive in, um, I am excited to work with them. Um, and introduce our moderator for today, who is Brenda Cardoza. Brenda is a member of National PTA's Family Engagement Committee. She's the first vice president of the Yonkers Council of PTAs and PTSAs and is the chairperson of the Yonker Council PTAs Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. She's been an active PTA member since 2008 and has led several PTA units in Yonkers. And if I could just say, is a lovely human being um, with an incredible orientation to learning and to supporting our kids and families. Brenda, I'm gonna turn it over to you to take us away with this panel. Thank you so much, Helen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be your moderator today. Um, today, I would like to start with um, welcoming our panelists um, and for taking the time to come and share your thoughts and, and you know your, your experiences with the community and PTA partnership. With that, I am excited to welcome today's panelists. If you would like to view the full bios of all today's panelists and um, speakers, um, you're able to do so by clicking on the link in the chat. Uh, we will start off with um, Deanna Creighton. She is the interim director of the Bernalillo Co um, County Community School Innovation and Strategic Partnerships Department, Albuquerque, New Mexico, where she leads her team in promoting the holistic well being and success of students, families, and community members by developing community schools in the region. Followed by Gloria Ruiz, who serves on the board of the New Mexico Parent Teacher Association as their chair of the family engagement. She sits on multiple statewide boards focused on educational equity and student success. Gloria also has nearly a decade of experience in the public sector working for the New Mexico Public Education Department. Melanie Maestas is a quality management coordinator at New Mexico Public Education Department's Community Schools Bureau, where she works to support schools with their grant deliverables. Prior to this, Melanie was a community school coordinator at East San Jose Elementary School, where she worked as a team to change the school-wide student outcome and family engagement statistics. Lastly will be Edda Ortiz, currently serves as the principal at a bilingual community school in New Mexico, East San Jose Elementary. Edda's 20 plus years in education experience has helped him create longstanding authentic relationships between his schools and the community. Let's start our discussion with Deanna. Deanna, thank you so much for joining us today. Since you have over a decade of experience working for and with community schools in New Mexico, we felt you would be the perfect person to provide our audience with an overview of what a community school is and how they differ from typical public school models. Can you tell us a bit about what community schools are and the role of families in them? Hi, Brenda. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me to speak with you today about the community school strategy. I definitely feel... Um, like this is part of my heart, I started this journey as a parent volunteer at my elementary school and just happened to be in the right place at the right time when the community school strategy was enrolling here in, in New Mexico. Um, and that was about 12 years ago and I've been doing this work ever since. And I am always happy to talk anywhere, anytime to anyone about community schools. So um, my pleasure to be here today. I actually wanted to start my comments today by asking you all a question. And if you wouldn't mind, you can put your um, responses in the chat if you like. My question, I'm gonna put it in the chat is, what if our education systems adapted and responded to the needs and strengths of families? That's a just a, a thought question because really what I wanna know is 
this question. How could a more family-centric education system address issues of equity and access in education? The community school strategy, first and foremost, is really an equity strategy. It is around um, engaging the voice of the community in authentic decision-making spaces. And the community includes the students, the school staff, and parents and family members. And so if you have thoughts on how a more or experiences on how a more family-centric education system can address equity. I would love to hear those thoughts. And then a couple more questions I'm gonna put for us to think about in the chat. What role do teachers, parents, and policymakers play? If we're co-designing and implementing an education system that really prioritizes families, needs, and wants, what role do we play in our spaces, right? Some of us are in a space to elevate the voices of parents and families to policymakers, And some of us are in a, in a role where we gather the data that's needed to bring results um, towards policymakers. So I think that we need to consider how our roles are specifically supporting this idea of co-designing an equitable education strategy. And then lastly, as community schools, we really think hard about fostering collaboration between schools and communities and families so that we can create a holistic approach to education, right? That supports the development of well-rounded children. And then the question becomes, well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we use a community school strategy as a transformation model and not a transaction model? And what I mean by that is community schools, um, the strategy of community schools is really there to transform schools. So a traditional school, it's a school. It has lots of things happening. There are students, there are parents, there are teachers, there's sometimes after school things, there's hopefully a school nurse, maybe there's a counselor, there might be some other things. But really, is anybody engaged in the decisions that are being made at that school? How are we working with the assets in our community to elevate and expand on the, on the opportunities that are already there? And how do we identify the gaps? that might exist that are creating barriers, maybe intentionally or unintentionally for our students and families to be successful. So the community school strategy really looks at how do we identify gaps and barriers and then how do we engage the assets of our community to transform that school into a thriving community hub. And that hub is built by and for educators, families, students, and community partners. And we do that so that students and families are engaged, healthy, empowered, and that they're members and they feel like they're members of their school and community. And really we want students to excel academically, which really is difficult to do if their voices are not heard, if the families are not engaged. Um, we want our students ultimately, right, to have lives filled with meaningful opportunities. And so that's really like what a community school is. In New Mexico, the way that we implement community schools is very hyper-local, and I'm so excited that you'll get to hear from East San Jose today, because they'll share with you exactly how their hyper-local approach had an impact on students and families and probably school staff as well. So, um, and Brenda, Brenda um, referenced the six key practices of community schools. One of them absolutely is powerful family and student engagement. And the the power in powerful family and student engagement really leads to, as we said, and I see lots of comments in the chat around, it's difficult to have equity in a hierarchical system. That is absolutely the tension and challenge of implementing community schools. We want our students and families to have an equitable and just educational experience. And we're trying to do it in a very traditional hierarchical and bureaucracy, right? And so how do we create a system that welcomes this kind of equity and democracy in voice. And um, what I have found in my experience is that happens when we engage in authentic relationship building. So when people, when families and educators make connections, for example, when families and educators work together on both school issues and community related issues, if a student is having trouble with their vision, the school and the community can come together to provide maybe vision screening and resources for that. But 
What if the student is worried that his glasses are going to be broken on his way home because he's walking through a neighborhood where someone might you know, steal his glasses or, you know, throw them on the ground or some other violent thing might happen, which is a reality, right, for some for some of our students. So really thinking about how we address those broader community wide challenges. Um, we want family members to feel welcome at the school. That's a key indicator, right, for how we know that this is working. How do we know that um, families uh, feel welcome? Well, we have to talk to them. We have to ask them. We have to ask them why they don't feel welcome. We have to find out what's been their experience in education. We want them not only to feel welcome, but we want them to be there. We want our parents to be roaming the halls, right? Um, we want them to feel like this is their school too. And part of what comes with that is a shared responsibility for student success. So um, as educators and teachers and parents and family members, we are all on the same page, right? We want the best for this student. And so why are we not working in partnership uh, to create those opportunities both for students to live at home and families to be able to support learning at home, but also for parents and family members to really be able to engage authentically with teachers and educators when concerns come up. And that does happen. I'm seeing lots of great positive comments in the chat about relationships. That only happens when there are authentic relationships. And then two more things I wanna just bring forward for us to consider together today is um, we've, I think we all believe strongly that we want students and families to feel that they are safe and that they are valued in our schools, right? And that their cultures and their languages are respected. And there are many, many ways, right, that we all can engage in making sure that we, that we uh, create the um, conditions for students and families to feel that way, right? That they are safe, valued, and respected. And then lastly, and I think that this one often gets forgotten, it's important to celebrate. Uh, when we do engage folks and we create these um, important relationships and these partnerships and we begin to transform our school into a democratic process, students, families, and educators experience joy and they report that they uh, experience these strong relationships. And so that's ultimately how community schools work, why community schools work, and what they do. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. Thank you so much, Deanna. Um, I love your answer. And I have to say that um, bringing in the student in the conversation is probably the most important piece in building those relationships. And when we think about community, we always kind of think about the surrounding, but never within. So thank you for really stressing how important the students and bringing the family in is, you know, makes the, the equation even better. Um, we Now we're going to go to, unfortunately, Gloria, um, is unable to be with us today um, and attend the, the webinar in person. So instead, she pre-recorded her answers to our questions. As the Family Engagement Chair for the New Mexico PTA, Gloria has a big role in creating and strengthening family school partnerships facilitated by PTAs across the state. I want to turn it over to her to tell us a bit more about New Mexico PTA and what they have been doing to foster strong partnerships between PTAs and community schools in New Mexico. Thank you, Gloria. Really great to be a part of the conversation today. Uh, in New Mexico PTA, we've been working really hard over the years to strengthen relationships between PTAs and our community schools. Uh, of course, we do that through our annual convention where we provide many opportunities for PTA leaders to strengthen their skills to go back and work within their school community. We also have training series and webinars um, about specific topics like family engagement, uh, where PTA leaders can learn more about all of the amazing resources that we have at both uh, New Mexico PTA and National PTA. Uh, what we've really been working hard on is fostering relationships between the coordinators of community schools and PTA leaders within that school uh, by helping create the environment where they can really work together towards a common goal uh, and work with others in the school district uh, that maybe they haven't thought about working with before, like attendance coordinators, maybe school board members, maybe families that they don't talk to every day that can help be a part of the conversation as well and helps bring light uh, to some of the topics that they're working on in their school. One example is New Mexico PTA recently received a health grant and we worked closely with 
Albuquerque public schools and PTA leaders within those schools who then reached out uh, to community members, organizations that help support that school. And what they did is they worked together to identify the need within um, the structure of a health grant. And they were able to, because they used surveys that were available in this health grant, to really make sure that they were able to satisfy the needs of their community, um, rather than just satisfying needs of a few. So we've seen PTA leaders work to help uh, facilitate these conversations. We're working hard at New Mexico PTA to help facilitate these conversations because we know these relationships are so valuable to the school community and to our students. Thank you so much for that, Gloria. Uh, we do appreciate you taking the time to create this video for our, our guests here today. Now that Deanne and Gloria have told us more about the intersection between community schools, PTAs, and family engagement, I want to bring in Melanie to describe what the relationship between a community school and a PTA looked like in her former school, East, Hans East San Jose Elementary. Melanie, thank you for being here and congratulations on recently stepping into your new role at the New Mexico Public Education Department's Community School Bureau. Could you tell us more about what a community school co coordinator does and how? When you were one, you partner with the PTA. Thank you, Brenda. I truly appreciate your time and every, everybody's time today. It's great to be here today. Um, PTA has been an asset to our school. Um, well, I used to work at East San Jose Elementary School and they were a true asset. Um, they brought a, a lot of insight, a lot of amazing things, and they helped us through everything, through planning and implementation. They even helped us change the statistics of the school, which I'm going to review. Um, one of the things that PTA did that they were highly involved in, it was um, our coffee events. They're called cafecitos in Spanish. And basically what we did is we had, we only had 1% of families attend these cafecitos and then PTA came together and helped us organize these events and plan them. And in as little as five months, we went from 1% to 72%. And so it was a, in, in, an, an amazing increase in family engagement um, that really, really did change the statistics of the school um, and the family relationships, staff relationships, student relationships, and it really made a difference. And during these events, we had coffee and donuts and pastries for our families. Um, one night we had board games, another night we had a science night, and other nights we just had literacy nights. And it was just every time it just got bigger and bigger, um, students were standing, parents and families were standing in the cafeteria. And we were just really happy to see that involvement with um, with our families and with our students and with our staff members as well and just building those relationships. So that was very amazing. Another thing that they helped with was the school dance and student engagement. And they organized, they helped organize the school dance and it was very successful. It was very engaging and students really appreciated that as well. Another thing that they helped with was a, a really big community event. It was a health and wellness. And um, during this event, um, we, br we brought together the community and we, we, we offered basic resources, we offered higher education resources, we offered wraparound resources, and we even offered free food. And PTA helped us organize this event. And it was a very big event. And it was really nice to see the community engage. It wasn't only e San Jose, it was the community that was um, Part of this event so it was really nice to see PTA just help us organize and plan this event as well. Um, another thing that they helped us do um, was helped us with the attendance. We 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 had um, in New Mexico we struggle with 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 chronic absenteeism and so PTA decided to help us organize events and um, so they helped us organize our our attendance assembly and then also our awards that we gave out. So that was really neat to see PTA highly involved in that. And another awesome thing that they helped us and they were part of was policy making. Um, we believe that families should be involved in policy making, that they should be part of, um, you know, passing those laws. And PTA helped us take a student to the roundhouse to pass a law. 
and that was a nutritional um, law. And so um, students now have healthy and universal meals in their table at the school. And that's also thanks to PTA for helping us organize that. And we brought some families, we took some families to the roundhouse. And so that was really neat to do that as well. So PTA was just really highly involved in our school and they helped us with so many things and they, they're still part of Isan Jose. And it's really nice to just see the impact that they could make for our families and our children and our staff members and have, what an amazing impact that they could make in our schools. Um, and then what is a coordinator? Um, a coordinator is a person that helps change the statistics of the school through authentic relationships. Um, we have um, schools in New Mexico have a council, um, like Diana was saying, and it's made out of um, students, families, stakeholders. Um, it's made out of community members and they come together to plan and implement. And PTA was part of this this council. And it was really nice to see PTA highly involved in our school and highly involved in our community to make changes in our school through this council. So they, they've been, they, they were all over the, the school, very involved, very, very appreciated of them. And just um, really happy that we, we have them um, in New Mexico and all over. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer, Melanie. You hit the nail on the head. Um, having a PTA in, within your school community is so vital because not only are we there to help um, facilitate events, but we also are advocates. And if the school or the district is in need of advocacy, we are, you know, the parents are the ones that come in to, um, you know, yelling and screaming for the things that our children need. So I really appreciate your answer, Melanie. Thank you. Rounding out our panel is Edda Ortiz. Edda is the principal of East San Jose Elementary School and worked closely with Melanie to develop authentic relationships between their school and their community. Edda, you must be in the middle of your school day, so we truly appreciate you taking the time to join us. As the principal of a community school in New Mexico, can you tell us what you have done as an administrator to foster this relationship between your school and your PTA? How have you seen this relationship benefit students, family, and the overall community? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me for, um, to this, this discussion. Um, and a great thanks to Melanie who spoke before me because she was a great foundation to what um, we have here currently at East San Jose. And yes, um, we're doing right now during our lunch duty. And matter of fact, we have PTA members doing our lunch duty because I'm uh, unable to help out. I'm usually out there, but thanks. It's always easy to call up our PTA members. Hey, we need some help today. And they rush over and they're helping out with our lunch duty today. Um, but one of the main things that um, we started off here at East San Jose from the administrative perspective, um, first of all, here at East San Jose, we believe in shared leadership. So it's not a top down model. And one of the first things we first figured out here at East San Jose was about developing a community within the school. If we wanted to present ourselves as a community school, we first had to identify our own identity, our own community here within um, the school campus. So that way we can then share that with our community as well, taking insight and understanding the culture, the students, the families, the history, and the voices that our community represents. So it was really important for us to develop a community through within the school so that we can present that to the community outside to the parents and to family and to the community abroad as well. As um, Melanie mentioned, um, one of the great assets of that was our cafecitos where when, uh, you know, I would try to encourage parents to come to the school to hear their voice because we want to validate what they say, not only listen to them, but to have a follow through as well to their ideas um, and thoughts of how we can improve as a school. And one of the great things she did when she came on as a school co a community coordinator was to do a needs assessment for our community. And that's where we began to understand what the community wanted better. So our cafecitos became more powerful because we began to relate to what the parents needing, such as providing supports for their children at home. And that's what um, we started off with three or four or five parents showing up to a cafecito before Melanie. Once Melanie arrived, we'd have over 200 um, family members in our cafeteria uh, 
um, participating in our literacy workshops, our science nights, and just have fun activities such as the board games that uh, Melanie mentioned. And this really helped build a stronger community and a bond and, and trust um, between school and home. And it's one of those things that's very important that um, it was mentioned, Deanna mentioned that the parents feel safe coming into our school. And that was very important to have that welcoming feeling that parents are welcome to East San Jose. And that's things that we built. So um, parents are welcomed here. They, they roam our hallways. I know there's always about a safety issue, but the more you get to build um, that those relationships with families and with parents, you start to build that community. So um, when the bell rings, parents are hanging out in the hallway talking to staff uh, because we want to build those relationships. Um, parents arrive here 45 minutes before the bell rings just so they can talk to one another and communicate with us because the more we learn from one another, the better we can understand. And our main goal is really to benefit our students and their children. And that's why we want to develop these relationships. And because of now parents um, have become educated through our cafecitos and they feel comfortable, um, we have parents coming and um, providing small group instruction to our students. Um, they could collaborate with teachers and we welcome them to come and observe us to see how the classroom works. We don't feel that nervousness so parents are overlooking us. We want them to overlook us. We want them to question us. We want them to be asking us, why are you doing this? And since we started doing that through our cafecitos and through our conversations, parents, we have a, a parent approach me saying, I would like to start this parent group of moms coming in and teaching small group instruction to students, even if it's just reading a book to a child. And we have that in a couple of classrooms. And that's something we're really proud of that we've able to have these parents and come actually provide instruction to our students. One of our main goals here at East San Jose, and we have two parents so far that do this, is having our parents become our substitute teachers. Teachers. And it's one of those things that we strive for because it builds that relationship. So those parents coming in, hey, that's my mom. Hey, that's my dad. And we want that family um, environment here at East San Jose. And again, all this led, to, and thanks to Melanie as well, to developing our PTA and having families to be part now of the decision process here at East San Jose and to be part of our vision. And through the community school council, them being active members of them, I'm involving them currently through our budgets. So it's about getting input through them, but also following through on what they say. Um, yes, fundraisers are great and everything, you know, in order to go to those field trips or to buy um, um, materials for our school. But but it's really having those parents to have their input, their thoughts, and value who they are and bring their experiences, their culture, and their voices into the decision process here at East San Jose. The benefits, once you have this collaborative community feel to your school, it starts to benefit the students. And like I said, that's our priority, our number one goal. And in the past two years, um, we've had our state scores doubled in reading and in math because we've um, that connection is strong between school and home. There's support in school and there's support at home. And again, parent voices are evident. It's an open dialogue. It creates trust. It creates engagement. And it's something that we value here at East San Jose. And at the end, all this hard work that we all do together as a team is benefiting our students in, in achieving their academic success, but also their social and cultural um, identities as well. So we take pride in all of this that we do here at East San Jose. And I would love to give thanks again to Melanie for bringing in her eyesight, insight here to East San Jose and doing that needs assessment to really understand what our community needed and then build off of that. And we're continuing the foundation that Melanie built for us here at East San Jose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edder. Um, I have to say that um, your response was very powerful. Um, and I love the cafecito. Um, you'll be surprised the magic of coffee and donuts, you know, to bring the families in. And we truly appreciate you and Melanie for um, just kind of opening the door and say, you know what, let's give this a try. And you know what, the trust is there. When the trust is there, then the families are happy and so are the children. So thank you so much, Edder. I want to thank all of all of you for your thoughtful answers. Since many of the members of our audience are community school and or PTA leaders, we would like to cap this conversation by asking each of you to please briefly provide one piece of advice you have for our audience to help them deepen authentic relationships between their community schools and PTAs. We would like to start with Deanna. 
Hi again. Um, and there's a lot of really great conversation happening in the chat around some of the challenges that we uh, tend to experience when we're engaging in this work. And so I think I would like to tailor my advice a little bit to that, and which is to say recognizing, right, that we have lived through a pandemic, that there have been very scary incidents happening at schools. And, um, and I just, I think that uh, we need to have more leaders like Principal Ortiz and like Melanie Maestas, who created the culture of belonging and safety and care at their school, which really can only be done, I think, through caring relationships and real communication. Those to me are really critical. I think that in my experience, this work can be really scary from all perspectives. It can be really scary for principals to give parents um, power and voice and to be responsive to them because they don't always know policy and procedure. So the principal's lens is to create a space for power and um, engagement in an authentic way while still holding the container of what is allowable according to school and state um, and, and federal policy, right? But sometimes we've learned that maybe the policies need to be changed a little bit. Maybe we can tweak them a little bit. What is within our locus of control and how collectively can we have some impact on that? Not all parents are comfortable coming into school. Somebody addressed that in the chat around folks that, you know, um, maybe immigrants or refugees or have other experiences, they may be afraid of coming to schools. And so how do we address those issues in an authentic, real way? Not all teachers are comfortable engaging parents. They're not taught that necessarily, right? And how to do that when they're becoming teachers. Um, and so the community school framework, I think, is really the answer to these shifts in power. It's a, it's a mindset shift. Um, it is the way that we engage voices and listen carefully. And I think that sometimes it's, a, it's just a heart. You just have yes in your heart. And you have to just be willing to set your ego aside. I think everybody would agree that parent engagement is critical for student success. How we do it can be the challenge, but I think we don't give up. And I think that we keep trying and we keep pushing and we keep asking for authentic relationships and we talk and we talk and we talk. And we also find out what's mutually beneficial, what's gonna pay dividends in the classroom for teachers, what's gonna pay dividends for the principal. Uh, the example that East San Jose gave us of improving their attendance strictly through family engagement is an example we have seen in other community schools here in Albuquerque as well. That pays dividends in the classroom, right? That shows that engaging families and students has academic outcomes in addition to all the other wonderful social and economic and, um, well, sorry, I lost my word for a second there, um, not socioeconomic, uh, emotional, social and emotional uh, supports that we provide for students and families. Thank you so much for your response, Deanna. Um, we will play now Gloria's answer. I think one great way that PTA leaders can strengthen the relationships between community schools and their PTA is thinking beyond the leaders that they have right in front of them. Oftentimes, um, your PTA leaders are the folks that you get to see very often. They're always willing to roll up their sleeves and help out with so much. And I think thinking about your own school community and you know all of the students that you have. So let's say you have 300 students at your school. We know that there has to at least be hundreds of adults within that school community that are there and that wanna help support uh, their school and their students. And so thinking about how you can reach people that you don't talk to every day that can help support the mission and the goals of community schools uh, and your PTA. And looking for those future leaders that you can help build up within your school and help build their capacity as well that maybe don't see themselves as leaders currently. And you can help develop that um, and strengthen those relationships. And so making sure that as people um, 
you talk to as PTA leaders, that you are connecting them, that you're meeting families right where they're at, that you are providing resources to them and information to them to get involved in the language that their families speak, uh, in the topics that are of interest to them. So constantly thinking about how you can reach out to people that, that you don't see very often and bringing and inviting them in is one great way that you can help strengthen that partnership. Thank you. Thank you again, Gloria, for your pre-recorded answer. We truly appreciate you taking the time. We're gonna jump into now Melanie for her response. Thank you so much. I think a way of just strengthening relationships is um, just letting PTA, inviting them and inviting families, just like we have it at East San Jose and really allowing families to be on campus, allowing families to have those, those relationships with teachers and really just feeling comfortable on the campus. I think them feeling welcome is the first thing is, you know, having that, that campus of feeling welcome and feeling, feeling safe in the environment and being able to do the work that they are doing and then just trusting PTA with the work that they're doing and supporting them and, and where you are able to support them. And by going to their meetings or attending and also showing your voice as well, sharing your voice is very important. Um, and just supporting them as well. Um, and then giving just opportunity for PTA just to do the work that they do and trust them and allow them to be able to um, be part of your campus and just, yeah, just have those, those authentic relationships. Thank you so much, Melanie. Adder, would you like to cap this and finish it off? Yeah, my main thing is um, about it's important that you build community within your school or within your organization first, because if everyone's not on board, if they have a, if a family member, a parent has a bad experience with a teacher, it ruins it with everybody or a staff member. So that's why it's really important to develop that community within your school. Everyone's on the same page. You have the same identity in regards to the importance of family engagement. Um, and the other thing that is be real. You can't fake it. You can't pretend that you want to do this and uh, oh, it's a requirement to have a parent be uh, part of this committee and just have them be there and present you got to be authentic with it and you got to really be genuine when speaking with parents that you do truly do value what they have to say um, parents can easily pick up when you're faking it because you know for, so it's like we can't um um think that our parents are, they may not have the education that I may have. That doesn't mean they're not smarter than me. I'm willing to listen because I learn from them. I'm very humble. Um, a master's does not mean I can, I know everything. I listen to my parents. I listen to students. I listen to staff members because they're my educators. I'm still a learner. So I'm, I'm constantly learning from each one of them. I tell them that everything they have to say is valuable and it's important to listen and to follow through. That's the thing, not just listening and then forgetting about it is to meeting with them a, a week or a couple. Oh, I remember that you said this to me. How can we continue to build on this? That's what's important. That's when families start seeing this. This guru truly does care about my child. I am willing to put in the effort now to make this connection stronger. So it's about being real um, and being authentic um, and communicating with the parents and to your students and to your staff as though you truly do care because at the end, the same thing I always say, the more we work together, your child's going to benefit. So, and that's all we want. We want every student to be successful. So let's work together in order to make this possible. Thank you so much for that, Elder. Um, I hope in the future you write a how-to book because I'll definitely go pick it up. Definitely very insightful. I would like to bring back in um, Kwesi for his um, reflection summation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Brenda. And what what a wonderful uh, panel. Yeah, I think we all we we all uh, like the idea of being a lifelong learner. We say that out loud in in, in in lots of settings. But I think, Edder, you're showing us how that actually works uh, in your context and all of you, really. I mean, this is all about continuing to learn. There's so many, so many gems that that I took note of. And thanks, Deanna, for giving us, you know, starting us off with some really thought-provoking questions. And you know, as I as I looked at your questions, it occurred to me that even though this 
these examples are taking place within the context of community schools, which is a specific strategy. But at the end of the day, these are the right strategies for any school. So whether you're actually a community school or not, if you're a school, if you've got staff, if you've got kids, if you've got parents, if you've got community, you should be trying to do these things um, regardless of what you're calling your, your strategy. So that's a reminder um, of what it means to really value all of these things. A couple of words that really came out I wanna to point to. Uh, intentional, there's a lot of intentionality going on here. Uh, we're not doing things by accident, but we're really doing our best to be intentional and to be focused in establishing relationships. We're being engaging, collaborative, inviting. Some of the questions in the Q&A around principals who uh, are afraid of their PTA and afraid of their, pre only want to talk to their PTA president and that kind of thing. You know, there's a principal that really could use a mindset shift. Uh, sadly, there are some of those kind of school leaders out there and I encourage folks to, to keep pushing and keep keep calling the question and keep forcing a different set of behaviors out of that principle to the extent that you can. Somebody talked about caring relationships uh, and that's always the key, that's foundational. Part of what um, uh, Edder was able to articulate is just the fruit of all the labor around creating caring relationships, creating a sense of family, creating a family environment with not only the families, but with staff as well. And then I heard a lot of creativity, uh, cafecitos and other food related activities. We all know that, you know, breaking bread together always sets a, a, a stage for folks. And then the last thing, lots of examples of these activities being linked to learning. academic ones. So just keep doing what you're doing. Um, very inspirational panel. Uh, and thanks for your moderation as well. Thank you so much, Crazy, for your um, for your thoughts. Sorry, my dog is barking, folks. Um, I just want to um, go back now to the audience. There was uh, many comments and some great questions. So we want to bring those forward. Um, one of the questions we would like to focus around and any of the panelists can answer this is um, on building relationship, right? Um, how to build these authentic relationships between the PTA leaders and administrators. Anybody would like to start off addressing that question? Hi, any of the panelists would like to um, talk about authentic relationships between the PTAs? to address the questions from the Q&A? Sure, I can answer it. Thank you. Um, I think it starts with administration and having that relationship with the principal and talking to the principal about what the goals are for PTA and hopefully the principal is receptive to that. Um, but I think it start, starts with with that administration and just really building that relationship with the principal, talking about their goals and their their vision statement, inviting the principal to the meeting, the PTA meeting, and then hopefully, um, you know, he or she is receptive and they're able to build that relationship and they're able to start planning um, and implementing things in the school. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that. Does anybody want to jump in and follow up on Melanie? Yes. I would just like to, Jim, because I was just looking at some of the questions online, and um, I know the district can be um, restrictive at times, but that's where as a leader, as a school, you have to take ownership of your school and your community, um, and yeah, um, and if there are district personnel here, it's okay, because I've said this to my supervisors as well. I'm going to do what's best for E San Jose. Um, I'll follow the guidelines, but I'm still going to be doing what's important to, um, to our community, to our students, and to our families. Um, it's about, you know, there are times you have to take a risk, but it's also about being present and visible for everyone. Um, here at East San Jose, we don't hide in our classrooms. 
All staff members interact with all families, and that's that's part of our identity um, because we want to build those relationships. So to start it off is not hiding. Um, teachers have a habit of staying in their classrooms, but we um, welcome communication within our staff so they can be visible at all times, and including myself. I'm visible at every morning. I'm greeting parents, greeting students before the bell rings. Um, when they come here before the bell rings, after school, I am always greeting parents, making myself visible, and and making myself um, 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 their presence so I can hear what they have to say. And I take all these thoughts and I share them with our staff. This is what I'm hearing from parents. Let's invite them, let's talk to them. And um, also listening to and teachers because they talk to parents as well. Um, constant communication, we use Class Dojo to communicate with parents all the time. So it's that open communication being visible all the time so that par when parents do have a concern, um, it it is to start that conversation rather than it, it being confrontational um, because we've already developed that um, trust and respect with one another that we can have an honest um, conversation and no confrontation is um, present. Thank you so much, Etta, for your, um, your response. Um, I want to jump into um, a few of the questions that were jumped in. As a parent myself of a, a child with a disability, um, you know, building that relationship is very important. And I know some of the things that were asked in the chat is, you know, how do you build relationship with family and students with disabilities and families with high school age students? Um, you know, in the PTA world, the concentration is usually the pre-K through eighth. Um, but we also have, you know, high schools um, that we want to be a part of, you know, uh, so we, you know, build those relationships. So any of our panelists is welcome to, you know, touch upon, you know, students of disability and high school students. How do you address those community and school partnerships? So Brenda, I did put a few things in the chat, in the Q&A um, in response to those two questions. So um, I, I did not work in a high school, but I have experienced supporting high schools. And we have seen some successful family engagement happen in high schools. Uh, what we what we emphasize is that the importance, as you've heard already many times today, of really listening and reaching out, um, finding out from parents what what is the barrier to them being engaged. Is it is it a time factor? Is it a language barrier? Is it a communication barrier? Often we found that parents are intimidated by high school teachers because they may not feel like they understand algebra or chemistry, and so they don't know how to engage to support their student when really there are lots of other ways that they can be engaged to support, but they don't know how. So what we implemented here at two of our high schools is um, called Homework Diner. It's something that we started at an elementary, but we moved it into the high school space. They called it College and Career Diner. And it was really more focused on you know, connecting families and students to, to various support services, resources around college, career readiness, graduation, um, even things like haircuts, uh, professional um, interviews, and things like that. But it really came from finding out from parents and from students. And then on the on the topic of disabilities, um, that's another, uh, what we have done previously is we engaged our, our statewide um, advocacy group called Disability Rights New Mexico. Every state has one like this. And they came to one of our high schools and they provided workshops to the staff and to parents around IEPs in particular. They even did a little uh, skit, um, just helping parents understand their role as advocates in an IEP meeting. There is often a power imbalance in that space. And then also helping teachers understand how parents feel in those spaces. But again, that's a high stakes situation, right? It's not ideal for relationship building when you're sitting in an IEP. So also thinking about how do we, how do we open up venues and avenues for conversation and relationship building outside of those high stakes meetings. Thank you so much, Deanna, um, I, uh, for your thoughtful answer. Um, I also saw um, a couple of um, comments or question around the topic of being um, in, back into the school building. I know that um, from experience, you know, four years later, we're still talking about COVID when our school building shut down. And now we're still talking about reopening. You know, what does that, that look like now? So what can we do about, you know, parents being back in the in 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 the buildings um you know we still have um buildings um school buildings that are not allowing families to um come in but like Edder, you know tends you know was focusing on was you know you build that relationship you want the parents in the building so um if any of the panel 
um, panelists would like to, you know, talk about, you know, how, how we could get back into opening the doors to our families where they're, you know, everybody's comfortable and there's trust. Well, I, 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 the district, when we COVID after the reopening, yes, there were like, oh, you can't do this. But I said, I need to do this. If you expect to follow what our goal is to um, pr um, support our students and our families, then I'm going to do it. But it makes it a lot easier if you know your families. You, I, they're not strangers entering the building. So every person I see, I know who they are. So it's not like I'm just letting random people into our school. It's because we built those relationships, even during COVID time. It was for us, the positive of that doing remote learning was we got to enter the homes of our families and got to see them in a different uh, perspective, which got us to know them better. So we built those relationships. So when I see people coming into our building, I know who they are. So it takes the time to build those relationships, get to know who they are. So there's no strangers coming into our building they're family members that I know, they greet me, I greet them, staff members know who they are. If there is someone that we don't know, right away parents are telling me, hey, who is that over there? So it, it's it's that's how it started with us here at East San Jose, developing those relationships. And I felt safe and comfortable allowing them, even though the district didn't say yes yet, I allowed it to happen. I was willing to just take that risk because they were not strangers. They're family members that I know. Thank you so much for that, um, Edda. Um, very thoughtful. And, um, you know, sometimes you got to break the rules a little bit just so that you could, you know, get the work going. So I, I'm a big rule breaker. So I I, I get it. Um, so, um, you know, going um, finalizing here, going back to um, the audience. The last question, and again, this is to the panelists, you know, why why should community and schools, why should, why, I'm sorry, why should community schools and PTAs partner? And I think back to what Kwesi said, not only community school, but in general, because some of our attendees, you know, don't necessarily go to these um, labeled community school, right? In general, how schools and PTAs should partners? Who would like to um, jump into that um, question? Brenda, was the question how or why? It's um, why, why? Well, I think we just spent an hour <laughs> talking about right. why. Um, be I mean, really, because it's the right thing to do, it's right? It. it is how schools should be. Schools should be the hub of their community. And that's what makes it a community school. I mean, really, right? Like under at the bottom, the bottom line, the most basic element is that students are in schools. And students are attached to families. And if we want to have, this is the future of our nation, right? This is the future generation. And if we want to see them be successful, we can't just isolate them from where they grow up, their community and their family and their school. All of those need to be connected for the success of all of us. Thank you, Deanna. And, and, and you're right. You know, we always talk about, you know, student success. Um, but I think that's really what we need is just to work together for, for the sake of, of, of the students, right? So I, I thank you again for, for your answer. Um, at this time, we are going to go back to the panelists and I would like to um, ask each of you to um, let the audience know how can, you know, they can get um, involved with, with, um, with the work that you do. Deanna, would you like to start? Sign up for the Community Schools Conference uh, in Atlanta at the end of May. It's a great way to go and learn and, and really get a boost from amazing folks all across the country who are doing incredible work. Thank you so much. Uh, Gloria? Daniel, is Gloria? Okay, there we go. There are some really wonderful resources available to PTA leaders and those that are supporting community schools. The first that I want to share is PTA.org. PTA leaders, be sure you go on there. There is an abundance of resources available for you all to use to support your own school community. If you're a community school leader or a parent, family member looking to support your own students, 
Learning Hero is an amazing resource that has so many topics that are relevant to supporting your students academically and socially and emotionally. For community school leaders and PTA leaders, I love 10 Minutes to PTA the Transformative Way. It is a YouTube series that National PTA offers. There are so many topics that are relevant for community schools, whether it's talking about engaging multilingual families, uh, talking about high school PTAs, or advocating for students with disabilities. You'll find so many great resources available on this site. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Gloria. Melanie, would you like to give your um, one minute um, last hurrah here? Yes, I think for me, it's just by supporting um, community schools and just supporting us. I think that would be the best way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Edder? Um, yeah, I would just like to say is understand your community and how to best serve them best. I grew up in a, in a low economic community in Los Angeles, and I assumed all poor communities were the same, and it was a realization they're not. So when I moved here to Albuquerque, I had to understand the community. Um, and here at Isano says, so it's really important to understand who you're serving, um, the makeup, the history, culture, um, voices, languages that your community offers. And how could it enrich you as an individual and your and your school and also just become more knowledgeable of the community school process. Um, thanks to Melanie, um, I was able to understand it a lot better and that helped us build what we have here at Isan Jose. Thank you so, so much, Edder. Daniel, welcome back. Thank you, Brenda. So thank you everyone once again for sharing all of those wonderful resources and also ways that our audience can connect back to the work that you're doing. Um, I just want to just once again, thank all of our panelists, thank our wonderful moderator, Brenda Cardoza. Um, thank you to editor for taking time out of your day, Melanie, Deanna, uh, Gloria for sending in all of her remarks to her questions. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be here and engaging in such a wonderful conversation. Um, and I also just want to thank uh, National PTA and, and the folks on our side, as well as uh, the Institute for Educational Leadership and Quasi's team. But before I close this out, I just really want to remind everyone that this session was fully recorded and that we'll be sending out this recording and the saved chat to everyone in a follow-up email in a couple of days. There will be an exit survey following this webinar. So please take a minute to fill this out so we can continue to improve our future webinar sessions and make them more relevant. Our next Transforming Family School Partnerships PTA National Standards webinar will be on Wednesday, April 3rd. And I saw some questions about this in the chat, so I'm excited to tell you what our next topic is. The focus of our next session will be on measuring and monitoring family engagement success, where we will hear from some featured speakers that are to be announced very soon about their work collecting and analyzing family engagement data at the district level and innovating evaluation approaches in the field. So everyone that registered for today's webinar has also been registered for the other webinars in the series. We encourage you to share out this registration link with your colleagues and contacts. I will be posting that in the chat now. And then once again, thank you everyone for your participation in this wonderful conversation today. We really look forward to seeing you next month at our fourth webinar. Have a good day. Thanks everyone. Thank you.